everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Maggie Howell and I'm the Executive Director here at the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, before we get started, just a quick review. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel and we'll provide time for questions at the end of Tom's talk. Also, a recorded version of the webinar will be available on the Wolf Conservation Center website in a day or two. Okay, so today we are joined by Tom Gable, who has generously offered to discuss the Voyager's Wolf Project and what he and his team are learning from the elusive wolves in the greater uh, Voyager's ecosystem in Northern Minnesota. Tom is a project lead of the Voyager's Wolf Project and a PhD student at the University of Minnesota. He's been studying wolves in the greater Voyager's ecosystem since 2014, when he started his master's at Northern Michigan University. Gable is particularly fascinated by wolf beaver interactions and much of his graduate work um, to date is focused on understanding how wolves hunt and kill beavers and conversely how beavers avoid fatal encounters with wolves. Much of Gable's early interest in wolves stemmed from encountering wolf tracks, kills and the occasional wolf while exploring the wild places around his family's cabin just outside Killarney Provincial Park, Ontario during the winter. During and after his bachelor's uh, in biology at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, Gable worked as a wolf research technician in Grand Teton National Park and on the Minnesota Wolf and Deer Project in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. His time in the wilderness area fostered a deep appreciation and love for the iconic North Wolves or North Woods of Minnesota. We're really excited to have Tom join us this evening. So without any further ado, uh, I'll turn the time over to him. It's all yours, Tom. Oops, you have to unmute you, sorry. Okay, I'm good? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to first thank the Wolf Conservation Center for inviting me to give this webinar um, for setting this all up. I'm really excited to be able to share what we're doing on the Voyager's Wolf Project with everyone. And I hope by the end of the talk, you'll kind of understand the work we're doing, how we're trying to do it, and sort of how that fits into understanding wolves as a species. So before I begin, I need to acknowledge my project collaborators, um, Austin Homkiss from Voyager's National Park, Dr. Steve Wendels of Voyager's National Park, and then Dr. Joseph Bump from the University of Minnesota. Additionally, I need to thank uh, our field crew this year and of all the years on the project. Um, we usually have a field crew of about seven to eight people uh, to help make the project work. And without their help, it really wouldn't be possible uh, to get the information that I'm going to share with you today. Um, our project is very field intensive, so these people are really integral to the project's success. So a little bit about the project. The project currently is a collaboration between the University of Minnesota and Voyagers National Park. In 2012, Voyagers National Park um, started doing some uh, basic wolf research. They wanted to understand a few basic um, aspects of the wolf population in the area. So they wanted to know how many packs were there, how many wolves were in each pack, what were the sources of mortality for the, the wolves in the area, and, and things like that. In 2015 is when we really started doing intensive wolf research during the summertime and that coincided with when I started my master's. Our current project objective is to understand the reproductive ecology, which is anything that deals with wolf pups, um, and the predation behavior of wolves during the summertime in the greater Voyagers ecosystem. So wolves are really doing two main things during the summer they are raising their pups and then they're hunting and killing prey so they can feed themselves and then also provision their pups. So if we want to have a comprehensive understanding of wolves during the summertime, we have to have a detailed um, understanding of these two facets of wolf ecology. So that's really what our project is focused on addressing. So if you're not familiar uh, with where the Greater Voyagers ecosystem is, it's in northern Minnesota. So you can see this uh, yellow outline at the top of Minnesota there. Uh, Voyagers National Park is actually that yellow outline. I'll show the Greater Voyagers ecosystem in a second. But the Greater Voyagers ecosystem borders Ontario, uh, Canada. So here's a zoomed in view of Voyagers National Park. And then here's the Greater Voyagers ecosystem, which includes a large area outside of the park. When we first started uh, this work, we really wanted to understand the wolves inside the park. But it quickly became apparent 
that there's very few wolf packs that exist solely within the boundaries of the park. Um, and that's largely because the park has this weird shape to it. So you can see in this picture, which shows all of the pack territories, we really only have two packs that exist solely within the park. And then we have several packs that straddle the border of the park. And so to understand what's affecting wolves inside of the park, we have to have a good understanding of what's going on outside of the park because the two aren't separated. And that national park boundary doesn't mean a lot for the wolves that are straddling that border. Um, so that's really why we study wolves both inside and outside of Voyager's National Park. So one thing that's important to understand about the Greater Voyager's ecosystem is what food's available to wolves. The primary food source for wolves year round in our area are white-tailed deer. Um, we do have some moose, but moose are really not a very important prey item for wolves. Um, the other really important food source for wolves in our area are beavers. And beavers are really what makes voyagers unique or special, I think. So voyagers has sustained extremely high beaver densities for about the past 40 years or so. And they're probably some of the highest beaver densities in the lower 48 states and probably uh, most of North America as well. So this map here shows all of the active beaver colonies we've identified during our aerial beaver surveys last year. So in total, there's 1,100 lodges in this map. Um, and so that's a ton of food if you're a wolf and can figure out how to catch these beavers. And because there's so many beavers, beavers are just really important food source for the wolves in general. <coughs> so this is what um, Voyagers looks like from the air. This is a picture I took during um, our beaver surveys two years ago. And the reason I like this picture is it captures how many beavers can be kind of crammed into a small area in the park. So right here, each of these white arrows points to an active beaver colony. So there's nine colonies in this picture. So again, it's a big food source if you're a wolf and can figure out how to catch them. So I'm gonna spend most of my talk today really focusing on the predation behavior work that we're doing. Um, but I do wanna to touch briefly on the reproductive ecology side of our project, because um, I think that's important. Um, so like I said, reproductive ecology is anything that deals with wolf pups. And so we wanna know the answer to questions such as where are wolves having their pups? So where are their dens? Where are they moving their pups throughout the summer season? So where are there other dens they might be moving pups to in their rendezvous sites? We wanna know how many pups packs are having, how many of those pups might actually be surviving to be a year old. And then we also wanna know what are the wolves feeding their pups to actually raise them to adulthood. And so we uh, get at this a lot of ways. One is by having GPS collars on wolves so we can learn where the dens and the rendezvous sites are. And then the other way we sort of understand wolf pup survival is by uh, tagging pups when they're really young. So we uh, generally put these little ear tags in four month old or four week old, sorry, wolf pups. And we also put a little microchip, which is like the same microchip you'd put in a dog. And these allow us to keep track of these animals as time goes on. We don't really have any GPS transmitters that are available and functional to put on a wolf pup. So we have to put on these little tags and hope that we um, can see these pups when they're older on remote cameras or we might catch and collar them later or something like that. So here's a pup that we, that we caught and ear tagged um, from the Bowman Bay pack last year. And it was the only pup we were able to tag. And for nine months, we lost track of this guy. We just didn't know where he was. It's really thick in Minnesota. It's hard to keep track of pups and you can't really observe them. Um, so we lost track of him until we got this footage from a remote camera. And before I play this, um, you can see the one ear tag in its one ear, the little blue backing to it. And so this let us know that this pup had reached adulthood, which is really cool. Um, and this footage is just really cool. We had a, a remote camera on a beaver dam and the pack had must have just killed a deer really close by. And so this pup uh, comes and looks right into the camera. So I'm gonna play it right here. And again, you can see the little green ear tag inside of its ear was when it looks right at the camera. So observations like this are some of the only ways that we can know for sure 
that certain wolf pups actually survive to be a year old until some sort of new technology comes available to actually follow pups, um, say through GPS or something, this is our best method and can be really valuable. The other way that we study uh, the number of pups that survive are by getting litter counts in the spring when the pups are really little and then having remote video cameras or photo or um, remote cameras spread across these territories and hoping that we get footage of wolves traveling with their pups and we can actually get counts of the number of pups in different months of the year. So what I'm going to show you is some video footage that we literally just got. We picked it up, this camera, up about a week ago. Um, so you're the first people to see it. And this is of the sheep ranch pack. And this is the sort of footage that we try to get that lets us know how many pups uh, different packs or how many pups might be surviving from different packs. And you want to turn your volume up for this. So here's probably the breeding female right here. And then you'll see that she has some pups in tow. And these pups are pretty typical size. Um, this photo or this video is from late July. So there's one pup that goes out of the screen and then there's two other pups that are playing in the back and they're eating blueberries and they're gonna come in and cross over here. And then a couple of them, which you'll see, will come check out the camera really close. So getting glimpses into sort of the, the secret lives of these wolf packs like that are really invaluable for us um, from a data standpoint. We would never be able to just sit in and observe three wolves traveling around or three pups traveling around together. Or if we did, we'd be extremely fortunate to see that. Um, so that's really valuable from a data standpoint. And then also, uh, we just get a lot of satisfaction of seeing our wolves through video footage like this because we literally never see the wolves that we follow. And so this is really our only time to observe them. So we try to get estimates of pup survival. And then we also uh, just try to get some uh, video footage of the behavioral um, or the behavior of wolves around their dens and their rendezvous sites. And so when we put up cameras on den sites, for example, we sometimes get really cool footage of of what the pups do. And so this is one just a really neat video that if you haven't seen will probably uh, make your day because it's really cool. Uh, but this is the first, uh, some of the first hobbles from this four week old wolf pup from the Wiopka Lake Pack this year. So we get neat footage like that. We try to share it as well through our social media platforms. But, but these sort of things are a way that we start to get an inside look into the secret lives of wolves and the reproductive ecology aspects of wolves. So I am going to now switch over to really the main focus of my talk, which is going to be discussing the predation work that we're doing during the summer. And this is really where I think our project's making a lot of headway in understanding some aspects of wolves that really were unknown before we started this work. So during the winter time, which is when most wolf predation work has happened, wolves are primarily traveling as a pack and as a cohesive unit. And as a result, um, studying wolves during the winter time is relatively easier than during the summer. And it's easier for a couple reasons. The first is that if you get a GPS collar or a radio collar in a pack or on one individual in a pack, you can then get up in an airplane you can locate where that individual wolf is and you can actually observe it from the air. 
You can see what the pack is doing. You can see how many pack members are traveling together, what the pack is eating or what they've killed. You can actually watch them making kills sometimes. You can watch the wolves interacting. So you can get a lot of great data that way. And a lot of the, I'd say, um, foundational wolf research happened during the winter time. Um, additionally, when wolves are moving together as a pack during the winter, they're primarily hunting and killing large prey. So they're killing prey such as adult deer and um, moose. And so when they're doing this, um, they're making a big sort of scene, a big kill site, and you can find those really easily. Um, the sites are full of blood and hair and different things like that. However, when the pack has their pups in the spring, things totally change uh, in terms of how the pack moves together. The pack stops traveling as a cohesive unit, and instead, individuals in the pack start moving as, um, as individuals or in small groups within the pack. So they start going and getting food by themselves, and then they come back to the den. And so the den really serves as a focal point for all wolf pack activity. And so this is what it might look like from a GPS collared wolf. Um, this is a wolf we had collared a couple years ago. <clears throat> and it's pretty obvious where the den is here, um, right in the middle where all those, all the lines sort of converge. And then what the wolf is doing is just making these forays away from the den, getting food and coming back and doing this over and over again. And so when wolves are doing this and moving primarily as an individual during the summertime, the wolves are primarily relying on, at least in our system, beavers and deer fawns, so small prey. And that's really where the trouble comes in. Understanding wolf predation on small prey has been really difficult, uh, in part due to the problems of studying wolves just during the summertime when you can't see them, um, and because of the challenges that small prey pose in terms of finding kills. So like I said, there, there are really two big problems. The first problem with studying wolf predation on small prey during the summer is that the forest is extremely thick in places like Voyagers National Park. So there's no practical way to observe wolves hunting and killing prey. So the really the only option we have is to use GPS tracking technology to see where wolves are traveling and to see where they might be making kills. And that's really where the second problem comes in. Even with GPS tracking technology, finding where wolves kill small prey uh, is really difficult because wolves can entirely consume a uh, deer fawn or a beaver in a really short period of time and leave virtually nothing left behind for us to find in the field. So if you can't actually observe wolves hunting and killing their prey, and then you can't find where they're making the kills after they've already made them, it makes it really tough to know what's actually going on out there during the summertime. And because understanding wolf predation during the summer is so difficult, there's a lot of really basic things that we don't know um, about how wolves interact in the north woods of Minnesota and Ontario and Michigan. So for example, we don't have any estimate of the number of fawns and beavers a typical wolf is killing during the summertime. And that's not just for Minnesota, that's for all the Great Lakes states and really anywhere that wolves, beavers, and deer coexist. And so when you think about it, it's actually quite astounding that we don't know the answer to that because there have been literally hundreds of thousands of hours of wolf research in the Great Lakes states, such as on uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and then also in Canada and Ontario. And yet we still don't have an answer to one of uh, a really basic sort of wolf ecology question. And because we don't know the answer to that question, we don't understand what affects how many fawns and beavers a typical wolf is killing. And because we don't know the answer to that, we really don't understand what effect wolf predation might be having on prey populations, because really there's a seven month black box where we don't know what's going on. So all of our assessment of what impact wolves might be having on prey populations is based on the five month window uh, of winter. And that might not really be indicative of the true relationship between wolves and their prey. So there's been a lot of work uh, on wolves and other carnivores as well that suggest that if you really want to understand their predation behavior, you have to go out and follow where they're going. You've got to put GPS collars on and try to understand where they're making their kills. And so in 2015, that's what we decided we were going to try to do. So in 2015, we started putting these sort of high-tech GPS collars on wolves. And these GPS collars take locations every 20 minutes. So we get 72 locations from each wolf each day. 
And then what we do from there is um, basically go search the areas that the wolves have been remaining, have remained stationary. So these are areas that might potentially be kills. So once that collar is deployed on an animal, all of the locations uh, that that collar takes are uploaded to a website. And this picture here is just a screenshot of what that website looks like. And this is actually seven days worth of locations from a wolf in the Lightfoot pack, uh, in, which is one of our study packs. And so we go, we look at all the data like this, and then we download it. We download the data and we run it through a computer program. And what that computer program does is it identifies everywhere that this wolf or a wolf has remained stationary for more than 20 minutes. And it sort of spits that out to us. So for example, if we took all these locations in this picture and we ran it through the computer program, what we would get out is a picture that looks like this. And so the computer program has identified all of these spots as um, potential kills because the wolf has remained stationary there. And so each one of these little spots is considered a cluster of GPS locations. Um, and this is what a cluster of locations might look like if you zoomed in. And so what we do is we download all of these GPS locations, all these clusters uh, onto GPSs and we have to hike out and search them and look for evidence that a kill occurred. And so when we started doing this, um, we realized that no one had successfully been able to actually study um, wolf predation during the summer in northern Minnesota or a similar ecosystem. So we really weren't sure how it was going to work out. Um, we were a little concerned that, that maybe we couldn't find actually where wolves are making a kill, but we did feel pretty strongly that wolves couldn't kill a deer fawn or a beaver and leave truly nothing behind. There had to be something. Unfortunately, uh, we were right. But what we realized is that the only way you can really find where these kills are occurring is by identifying areas of disturbance in the leaf litter or the vegetation. So you're usually not going to find a bunch of bones and hair and blood and things like that. You're just going to find an area that's been trampled down and there might be some prey remains in that area. So this photo here is a perfect example of that. Austin here is taking a picture of where a wolf killed a deer fawn. And the way that we found this kill, um, which is right there in that white circle, is by uh, noticing that that little area had uh, a bunch of smashed vegetation there. And that let us know that something had to have occurred there. Um, all of the habitat behind it, or the vegetation, is all upright. It's not disturbed. There's nothing uh, that looks abnormal. So we found this area of depressed vegetation, and we quite literally got on our hands and knees and slowly combed through the, the downed leaves and the leaf litter looking for any remains from this fawn. And in this particular example, what we found were um, in this bag here. We found a little bit of bone, a little bit of tissue, and then the tip of a fawn hoof. And that is pretty typical for kills during uh, the June time period because the fawns are so small. Here are a couple other examples of this. Um, on the left in the bag is the remains of another fawn. Um, and there's a little bit of bone and then two teeth. Then on the right hand side is another kill and there's a hoof, a tooth, and then a little uh, piece of bone and that's it. So you can imagine that if you don't know what you're looking for, it would be so easy just to walk by these because it's so, uh, it requires such an attention to detail to actually find these kills, which is probably in part why it's been so difficult to understand uh, where wolves are making kills. And finding where wolves kill beavers uh, can be equally as challenging sometimes. So this is a picture uh, and in it uh, is where a wolf killed a beaver kit and a kit is just a yearling, a young of the year beaver. So the wolf killed the beaver right there in that black circle. And the next picture I'm gonna show is me looking straight down into that bed. And you're gonna see effectively what I saw, which was this. And you can kind of make out this oval shaped uh, area that's sort of depressed where the wolf was laying down. And then all that was left of the beaver kit were its front incisors, uh, a little bit of its stomach contents, which are sitting below the incisors. And then on the left hand side, there's a little bit of fur that's caught in the vegetation. And that's it. So again, not a whole lot. So, so far on our project, um, we've been able to search 10,127 clusters of these GPS locations. 
Um, so that equates to a total of, I believe, 102,000 individual GPS locations from collared wolves that we've studied, or that we've been able to search. And this has been very field intensive work um, because wolves cover huge areas for their territories. And so if we want to understand what wolves are doing during the summer, we also have to cover these huge areas. So, so far searching this many clusters, we estimate has probably taken around uh, 12,500 hours of field work and likely somewhere around 15,000 to 16,000 miles of hiking. So while it's been really field intensive, it's also been really fruitful for us. So, so far we have been able to find 618 kills um, that wolves have made. 303 of these have been deer fawns, 182 have been beavers, 86 have been adult deer. We've had one moose that was killed and then we've had 41 miscellaneous kills. And these include everything from turtles to hares to raccoons to geese, swans, ducks, you name it. If wolves can catch and kill it, they will. So we've documented a lot of interesting uh, prey items. So I do want to briefly kind of come back to this uh, answering this question, that basic question of how many fawns and beavers does the typical wolf actually kill during the summertime? And uh, what I'm presenting, these are very preliminary. It's only from a relatively small sample size, but I think it probably gets close um, to what's actually going on. So on average, what we have found is that a typical wolf in our system is going to be killing between 13 and 15 deer fawns. But the number of fawns killed by an individual wolf appears to be highly variable. We've had some wolves that have only killed two, <clears throat> and then we've had some that have killed up to 33 fawns. Same thing's true of beavers. On average, a typical wolf is going to kill between eight to 10 beavers, um, but this varies widely. We've had some wolves that haven't killed a single beaver, <clears throat> and then we had one wolf last year that killed 28 beavers. And to put 28 beavers uh, into perspective, this is a, maybe a good way to think about it. In Voyagers National Park, the typical beaver lodge uh, has five beavers in it. So that means that this one wolf by itself removed five and a half beaver colonies in its territory uh, from April to October uh, of last year. So that's pretty incredible. And then wolves do kill adult deer, um, but they're mainly doing this on the shoulder months of that ice free or the summer season. Um, so in the early spring when the pack is still sort of traveling together a little bit. And then again in the fall when the pups are almost fully grown and they're traveling around with the pack and the pack starts hunting and killing deer. Um, but it's really difficult to estimate on a per wolf basis how many deer they're killing just because usually it's the whole pack and not just an individual wolf. So one of the questions that we're really interested in trying to understand is what really drives this variability in the number of fawns and beavers that individual wolves are killing. And there's several things that we're looking at that might explain the patterns we're seeing. The first uh, possible explanation is that maybe um, the variability we're seeing is simply a result of the number of prey in a wolf's territory. So if you're a wolf and you're in a territory that has a ton of beavers, maybe you just kill a ton of beavers because there's a lot of them around. Or same thing with maybe deer or deer fawns. But perhaps it's not that. Maybe it's a result of pack specialization. Maybe there's certain packs and individuals within packs that have learned to specialize on particular prey. Um, so for example, packs have learned to specialize on hunting and killing beavers. Um, there certainly are packs in Western North America that have uh, appeared to sort of specialize on certain pilot species, but it seems plausible that that might happen uh, here in Voyagers National Park too. But perhaps it's neither of those. Maybe it's all just due to individual ability. Wolves are primarily traveling around as individuals, so they're hunting and killing their prey individually during the summertime. And so maybe there's just some wolves that are just better at hunting and killing prey than other wolves in the same way that some people are just naturally more athletic than other people. Or perhaps none of those explanations are right and maybe it's all related to the energetic demand of wolf pups. So if you're a wolf and you're in a pack that has a lot of wolf pups, there's probably a larger energetic demand placed on the adults of that pack. And so maybe you just need to kill more prey to feed yourself and then also feed the pups. So we don't really know what's 
uh, most likely going on here. It's really difficult to tell. And part of that's due to the fact that we have a relatively small sample size of collared wolves. There's a lot of variables that we have to account for. Um, and so to really answer this question effectively is going to require um, 10, 12 years of data at, me, at least. Um, and that's because we're only able to follow about six to seven wolves really intensively for the duration of the summer. And that's just because it just takes so much effort. So to get a large enough sample size to answer this question is gonna take a lot of time. So now I kind of want to switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about some of the cool findings that we've found throughout our research, or at least some of the highlights uh, to us and, and what other people have thought are some really cool things. So the first is that we have a pack of wolves, the Bowman Bay pack, that has learned to hunt and catch spawning spiders in the springtime here. And to our knowledge, this is the first documented account of wolves hunting and killing freshwater fish. Researchers have known for a long time that wolves will go uh, hunt and kill spawning salmon in areas of coastal Alaska and British Columbia. Um, but that's a lot different. A uh, spawning salmon uh, run is a lot different than say suckers running up a small little creek off of a lake in Minnesota. Um, so we are really excited to actually document this uh, happening because it's such a unique behavior. And we really learned of it initially because we had a GPS collared wolf in the Bowman Bay pack and we would go search clusters of locations from that wolf and it would be around this creek in May and we'd show up and we'd find uh, blood and fish guts and scales and all the stuff along with a ton of wolf tracks. And so we sort of connected the dots and realized, oh, they're, they're catching fish. So then in 2018, we wanted to try to actually catch this behavior on video. And so we had one remote video camera and we went and put it on this creek because we saw that one of our collared wolves was hanging out around that creek. And luckily we were able to actually get this behavior on uh, video footage, which I'm gonna show you in a second here. Uh, and again, this is uh, to our knowledge, the first ever documented uh, video footage of wolves hunting and catching freshwater fish. So uh, it's really neat. So I'm gonna, this, there's going to be a slow motion of that last one. You can see the fish swimming in the water there right before the wolf catches it. And it appears one of the ways that um, these wolves really figured out how to hunt and catch these fish is by listening to the fish breaking the surface. Um, and so when you watch the video, or at least I've watched it multiple times, you can actually, every time there's a little ripple in the water, that's when the wolves start heading back towards the creek. Uh, that's really neat um, and we were really excited to get this footage and so a question we had this year is if this behavior was actually going to continue for another year um, and luckily it did occur again this year uh, in May and we had a lot of video cameras around this creek this year hoping to get some more uh, footage of this really rare behavior and uh, I'm going to show you a clip um, that we got from one of these cameras um, this is of the breeding male of the Bowman Bay pack, and it's him going after a fish unsuccessfully. Um, we have a lot more of this footage that we're going to share soon via our social media accounts. So if you wanna see more, just uh, pay attention to those and that'll uh, let you see uh, all the cool stuff we got. So here we go. So it seems that uh, we got a lot of footage of wolves being unsuccessful at chasing fish, um, kind of like this. So it might be maybe a little bit more difficult for them to, to snag these fish than you might have thought. So this sort of leads into the next thing that we found, I think, pretty well, and that's that wolf diets are very flexible. 
So wolves are able to respond to different food sources very quickly. And this is probably what allows them to adapt to a variety of different environments. So not only do they, they go after fish, but they go after a bunch of other stuff too. And one of the interesting things that they eat in Voyagers that isn't common in a lot of other places are blueberries um, and other berries as well, but primarily blueberries. So blueberries can make up to 80% of the weekly diet of wolf packs in this area in July, which is peak berry season. And unlike uh, the fishing wolves, which is really uh, specific to one pack that's learned how to do it, the berry consumption is something that every pack that we've studied has done pretty much every year that we have followed them. Um, so this is something that happens year after year after year. So we've really been trying to understand this behavior in more detail um, because it is so interesting. One thing that we've been trying to do was get video footage of wolves eating blueberries because we thought it'd be pretty neat to actually see how do they go about doing this. Um, so last year we set up 12 remote cameras and were unsuccessful at actually getting the footage of them eating berries. So this year we went back out and sort of crossed our fingers and hoped things would work out. And luckily they did. And you are some of the first people to see uh, this footage because we just got it a couple weeks ago. But here is a wolf. This is wolf V082 of the sheep ranch pack and uh, it's him uh, mowing down on some berries. So turn up the volume if you want. You can hear him sort of like smacking his lips as he goes around and, and pulls berries. So uh, B082 was not the only uh, wolf that we got eating berries. Uh, we actually got several other wolves from this pack eating it, or uh, eating berries. But I think uh, what's really interesting about this is that B082 uh, would go to a patch of berries, spend about five minutes there, eat a bunch of berries, and then keep moving. And so it's kind of an interesting thought to think that all the wolves in our area are doing this in July on these different hills where all the berries are. So one of the areas that I'm really interested in is understanding wolf beaver interactions because beavers are such an important food source for wolves up here. So in 2015, when we started our work, um, this great book came out called Wolves on the Hunt, The Behavior of Wolves Hunting Wild Prey by Dave Meech, Doug Smith, and Dan McNulty. And what this book was is really a comprehensive review on how wolves hunt their different wild prey. <clears throat> and the book was a couple hundred pages long but the section on beavers was about three paragraphs long in which they concluded that there weren't any actual descriptions of wolves hunting beavers. So basically no one knew how wolves actually did this. And so that uh, was something that we then became really interested in trying to answer. How do wolves actually do it? Because our wolves have to be doing this all the time. What we found is that wolves primarily ambush beavers and um, this might not seem particularly novel, but I'll explain why it is in a second. But what wolves do generally is they go and they bed down next to areas that beavers are using on land, such as beaver dams, feeding trails, lodges, etc. And the wolves will just bed down and wait for hours, four, six, 12 hours for these long periods of time, just waiting for a beaver to come on land. And so um, again, like I said, that might not seem really uh, interesting because how else would a wolf actually catch a beaver? But we have to really think of what wolves are like as predators generally. And wolves are primarily thought of as cursorial predators, meaning that they primarily hunt and kill their prey by outrunning and outlasting it. They're not using a lot of strategy or tactics or anything like that. Um, and really, they've not been thought to use ambush behaviors either. So the work that, that we did looking at wolves hunting beavers was the first published work that systematically documented that wolves are able to use ambushing hunting behavior to kill their prey. 
And what I think is really fascinating in our area is that wolves are able to go back and forth between these ambushing hunting strategies to kill beavers and then these cursorial hunting strategies to kill deer and moose. And they can toggle sort of back and forth between them depending on their prey they're going at. And so that sort of flexibility in their hunting strategies is really unique, I think, amongst large carnivores. So we're still doing a lot more work trying to understand how wolves actually hunt and kill beavers, where are wolves waiting for them, what time are they trying to hunt beavers, etc., as well as how are beavers also avoiding getting killed by wolves. Um, and so we should have some cool updates on this in the next year or so. And then the last sort of interesting thing, and I wouldn't necessarily call this uh, a finding, but something that we were able to show in a unique way, uh, is that wolves are territorial. So we made this map which shows the GPS uh, travel paths of collared wolves in seven packs that are all adjacent to one another. And what it does is uh, clearly show where those territorial boundaries are and that the wolves generally try to avoid each other's territories because they can be risky places. Um, and so I think we were able to really show this in a unique way. And so we put this online and it uh, was sort of went viral. Um, and so that's really cool because I think it shows this concept that everyone knows, but it's so hard to actually envision what does that actually look like um, in real life. And so this is what territoriality means if you're a wolf. So I am going to end um, my talk really talking about what our uh, objective is for the Voyager's Wolf Project going forward. Um, our hope is that we can establish the Voyager's Wolf Project as a long-term wolf research project. <clears throat> and so we are currently um, trying to find funding sources uh, through either private donors, foundations, granting agencies that will allow us to really establish the project uh, as a long-term study and, and keep us going forward. And so the reason that we want to do that is that we think long-term research uh, is really invaluable. And if you need examples of that, we only need to look to places like Yellowstone National Park or Isle Royale National Park, where these long-term wolf studies have been going on. And as time goes on, we're learning so much more about wolves and wolf ecology um, through these studies because they've been able to look at changes through time. And so we're optimistic that we can do the same thing here in Voyagers. And Voyagers is really a very different system than say Yellowstone National Park or even Isle Royale. Um, additionally, long-term wolf research uh, projects generate a lot of public interest uh, and support for wolves, but not just wolves, but for wildlife and also national parks as well. Um, and so we think that by establishing the Voyager's Wolf Project as a long-term study, um, that we could do the same thing here for Voyager's National Park and the wolves uh, that are sort of uh, really unique and interesting from this area. So with that, I need to thank, again, all of the technicians and field crew that have helped make this project possible. And then I need to acknowledge all of our funding sources currently, including Voyager's National Park, the University of Minnesota, the Voyager's National Park Association, uh, et cetera, many more. And with that, um, I'll take any questions people have. Um, I do wanna note that if you're interested in staying up to date with the Voyager's Wolf Project, um, feel free to follow us on Facebook or Instagram, which is where we're updating and sharing videos and things like that pretty frequently. Additionally, you can check out our website, which is on the bottom. And also at our website, uh, you can make donations to the project and a lot of individual donations help us cover costs such as uh, remote cameras and GPS collars and things like that. So all that information can be found there really easily. So with that, I'll take any questions people have. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, this is really so cool. Uh, so we will go ahead and take some questions uh, now, but for those of you who joined um, after the introduction, we are here with Tom Gable, uh, who just finished his talk about the Voyages Wolf uh, Project in Northern Minnesota. Um, and for anyone that does have questions, please be sure to type your questions in the Q&A box in the control panel. Okay, so um, the first question asks, um, are wolves purposely uh, denning next to beaver lodges? Well, that's a great question. Um, so if you read the scientific literature, especially stuff from like the 70s and 80s, you would get the impression that they are, that they're putting their dens uh, specifically where there's food and, and mainly beavers. 
And we've really not seen anything to suggest that that's true. Generally, wolves are putting their dens in places that are probably providing a lot of protection for pups <clears throat> and also providing access to water for the female because lactating females require a lot of water. Um, we do have uh, uh, dens that are close to beaver ponds. We have yet to find a kill uh, at near or around a den um, or even a rendezvous site. And we really haven't found hardly any kills within five to 700 meters of active den or rendezvous site, suggesting that most wolf foraging is occurring a good ways from the den and not really close to it. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Here's another. Can you clarify the amount of time in the year that wolves spend outside the pack hunting as individuals? So that's a, a good question. It's, it's somewhat variable depending on the wolf and the social status of the wolf. Um, what we've generally seen is starting in about um, mid to late April is when they start traveling as individuals or I'd say largely as individuals and they seem to remain uh, as individuals or traveling primarily as individuals until the middle to the end of August and usually that coincides with when uh, the pups are still uh, sort of um, unable to travel, unable to travel with the pack. So once the pups are able to start moving around with the pack, we start to see the wolves traveling together uh, making kills together and things like that. But it is, it is variable. It does seem um, that the breeding individuals seem to spend a little bit more time with one another throughout the summer away from the den than the uh, yearling and juvenile wolves do with each other or with the breeding animals. Okay, have the number of packs fluctuated since you've uh, started the project? Uh, not really. We've Most of our um, pack territories are relatively stable. There's some change from year to year, but the total number of packs um, have remained relatively stationary. Um, and our area is what would be considered uh, by pretty much any standard a high density wolf population. Um, our, our estimates are always on sort of the high end of the scientific literature of the number of wolves in the area. Um, so we don't see a lot of change. And if there ever is like a vacancy that's available, it seems that that is quickly filled that territory vacancy by other wolves coming in. Okay. Um, how does an animal, in this case a wolf, learn that it's safe to eat a new food source like blueberries? <laughs> uh, your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. Um, probably through trial and error is my guess. Um, wolves. Uh, like dogs don't seem to have any problem with putting all sorts of objects uh, in their mouths and chewing on things. And I'm guessing they just uh, chew on things until it tastes good or makes them feel full. And that's uh, a source of food that they then go back to. Okay, great. There are a lot of questions. Also a lot of, uh, a lot of great comments of how much uh, people are enjoying this. So great, great. Do that, Tom. Um, how many black wolves have you found on Voyagers? What's the frequency of black wolves? It's super rare. We have not collared a wolf that is black. We've collared 75 wolves and I don't think we've caught, no, we haven't collared a single one that's totally black. Um, every year it seems we might get one wolf on our remote cameras that's a black wolf, but that's, you know, one out of maybe 50, 60 wolves. Um, we have had a couple packs where we know there's one black wolf in it. Um, and then that, uh, <clears throat> that black wolf leaves and um, then we don't ever see a black wolf again. So it's really uncommon. Um, are any of the wolves and voyagers candidates for the Isle Royal project? Nope. Nope. All the Isle Royal stuff has happened, happened more in the northeastern part of the state, so not in our area. Got it. Uh, is the beaver population self-sustaining? Yes, the beaver population seems to be self-sustaining. Um, wolves don't really seem to be putting much of a dent in the beaver population, and it's probably because we just have so many beavers um, in the area that wolves would have to eat an incredible number of beavers to actually have uh, a substantial influence. So a lot of the beaver population fluctuations we see are almost certainly related to things outside of wolves, such as habitat quality, uh, climate, weather, things like that. Uh, is it likely that wolves would eventually teach um, each other to fish in streams available in Voyagers Park? That is an a great question. Um, that is something that we've wondered about. I'm guessing the answer is yes. 
but it's a hard thing to really measure or to, to study. Like, how do you know? Um, what we think um, is that generally there's the breeding pair and that the breeding pair of this particular pack has remained intact ever since we've documented these wolves fishing. And so we guess or assume that they're teaching their offspring um, to hunt and catch fish one way or the other. What will be really interesting is to see <clears throat> when this pack eventually uh, fades away because the breeding pair dies, if the pack that then takes over that territory, if they actually learn to hunt and catch fish. <clears throat> because it's possible that for whatever this one stream has just the perfect characteristics for wolves to catch fish. And so every pack that occupies that territory just always catches fish there. Um, but it's also possible that maybe this one pack is really unique and they just figured it out and not a lot of other wolves would have done that. So we don't know, but it's a really interesting idea. I have a quick follow-up question about this fishing pack. <laughs> um, sure. The first footage that you showed of the wolf that was very successful, was that all like the same session? Yeah, that was one night. Uh, he was, uh, that, uh, that wolf was, looked like a juvenile uh, wolf that was just sitting there and for a couple hours he just sat there, you know, and, and just kept waiting. And so we, we didn't share a lot of the footage that was just him standing there because it's not nearly as exciting. Um, but there was a lot of just standing and sort of waiting around and that seems to be what they do. They just sit there and they wait for fish to come up the creek and they, uh, they nail them when they can get them. And did you see, did it seem like the other wolves in that family were as uh, uh, successful or talented at that? Yeah, so that, um, we had two collared wolves in that pack um, that were spending a ton of time by that creek as well. Um, and so we went to the areas that those wolves had been hanging out and there were fish scales everywhere, um, fish guts and blood and all sorts of stuff. So it seemed that they were uh, all down there. So it was really a family affair, but I'm guessing they just sort of fish in different places from each other, which is why we only got one wolf there. Ah, and sorry, this is my own questions again about the fish. Um, do they eat the entire fish? It seems like it, yep, everything, just gone. Interesting. Okay, uh, another question. What is the average size of a male, their weight? Uh, in our area, it's 31 kilograms. Females are uh, 25, so our average wolf is 28 kilograms. So we generally have small-bodied wolves here. And what is that in pounds? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, like 68 pounds for males and like 59, I think, for females. That's my rough guess if I had to convert it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, is their energy level the same in the winter as in the summer, considering their diet is 80% blueberries in the summer? That's a good question. I'm guessing their, their energy requirements are probably similar. Um, their ability to catch and kill prey, though, is very different. Winter is when wolves are really going to be making uh, sort of their hay. It's when they're going to be able to take down deer that are nutritionally compromised. Um, during the summertime, that's really the lean season for wolves. So, um, generally the way it works out is that the pups by July, for example, are about three months old. So they're getting bigger and bigger and they require a lot of food to keep growing. Deer fawns are primarily available to wolves in the June time period. So that's when the fawns are born and that's when wolves can really catch a lot of them. But by the end of June, um, deer fawns become able to escape predators or a lot of them become able to escape predators. So it gets a lot harder for wolves to actually catch and kill them. At the same time, their other food source, which is beavers, um, are spending a lot more time in the pond eating aquatic vegetation. So they're not coming on land as much. So now you have this situation where wolves need more energy to feed their pups and themselves, and yet the food sources they really need are becoming harder and harder for them to get. And so it seems likely that that's why they turn to blueberries, that blueberries are really um, sort of a starvation food, or at least they, they slow uh, starvation or weight loss because wolves can sit in a relatively confined area, they don't have to travel a lot, and they can just eat berries. Um, so it's not that they're that the berries are maybe like helping them put on a weight, it's just helping them get through a time where other prey is relatively scarce. Have you seen a lot of uh, starvation where it's been lethal during your study? We've only seen uh, one instance which happened recently. Um, we had a collared wolf that we collared in May and um, it was a, uh, in good condition, it was a yearling wolf. So it had spent 
probably the it's the first year of its life were primarily dependent on its parents um, and we were able to get a collar on that wolf and we followed it around and it just seemed um, incapable of finding food and so um, in about two and a half months, it went from weighing um, 27 kilograms, which is uh, like 63 pounds, 60 pounds. And um, it ended up starving uh, in the middle of August at, and it came in at a weight of 31 pounds. Um, so it just couldn't catch food. And so it, it died as a result. Um, so I wouldn't say starvation is, is super common, but it certainly does happen um, because it's it can be challenging for wolves to find prey, especially when they don't have the experience, like a yearling, they wouldn't have any experience um, hunting prey. So they would need to sort of figure it out fast or they're gonna die. Sad, but interesting. Um, what kind of reception have you had from the local community for your field work, as many of the packs have territory outside of the park? I would say, generally speaking, um, it's been very positive and we've actually enjoyed it. I'm Certainly, I would say there's a lot of people in northern Minnesota who um, wolves are a very hot topic for. Uh, many people who might not maybe be the biggest fans of wolves. Um, but interestingly, because there are so many uh, private properties south of the park, we've had to do a lot of work um, on private land. And so we have gone around, we've contacted 88 landowners um, asking for permission on their property and 87 of them have given us permission. And so these aren't necessarily people who I'd say are, are really big uh, wolf fans or advocates. Um, they might actually be the opposite, but they've been willing to work with us because of the work we're doing. And we've been very, try to, we try to be very transparent in the work we're doing um, and share with them information that we're learning. And so I think in that level, like, or in that, uh, on that level, things have been extremely positive. Um, we've been able to do our work, we've been able to make a lot of really good uh, inroads with the local community. Um, and, and so that's really been exciting, I think, because when we started, the work here, I wasn't, I never would have guessed that we would have had the success we've had working with local landowners. So that's been great. That is great. Um, do you have any evidence of wolves dispersing blueberry seeds? So that's a good question. Um, yes, it, it depends how you define dispersal, but yes, wolves certainly eat blueberries in certain patches and then they go elsewhere and uh, poop out the berry seeds and then, uh, Maybe those berry seeds grow, maybe they don't. So we don't know, but it's, uh, that is something that we are looking into um, and hope to have some answers on in a couple of years. Um, but definitely wolves are like any large um, roaming predator, they cover a lot of ground. And so um, they're gonna be dispersing these at least locally. And maybe in some instances, maybe they disperse in a long ways, we're not sure. Interesting. Um, what's the primary cause of death for these wolves? Um, if you're, if a wolf remains solely in the park, um, the primary cause of death is going to usually be, um, from other wolves, intraspecific strife, um, outside of the park, it's probably going to be human cost, like in a lot of areas of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, so that could either be, um, intentionally. So through like illegal, um, poaching or hunting or something like that, it could be through getting, uh, hit by cars. Um, and then. Uh, we've had some wolves south of the park that have uh, killed each other, um, but generally it's going to be human caused south of the park and then in the park it's going to be wolf caused or naturally caused. But generally it's wolves or other um, other prey, or sorry, not other prey, um, other diseases. And then sometimes we have had wolves that literally just sort of die because they've gotten so old, they've worn down their teeth to really just nubs, like they don't have any teeth left and they're just slowly um, starving as a result. Um, but that's rare because very few wolves live to get to that age where that actually happens. Okay, um, going back to the slide on wolves, uh, their territorial movements, mm -hmm. one pack, the white one, seemed to make long movements into two other pack territories. Was this a larger pack than the others? Uh, no, that pack was the same size. Um, Sometimes wolves do things that are hard to understand why they do them um, without getting in sort of the mind of the wolf or being able to observe the, the events. Um, we don't know why that wolf um, did that. That wolf is actually the breeding female of that pack. <clears throat> and uh, we have her collared this year as well. Um, and so movements like that are, I'd say, 
generally uncommon. Like it might look like she goes and spends a lot of time there, but really that represents like maybe an eight hour trip out of the territory and back. Um, so maybe she was chasing prey, maybe chasing another wolf, maybe it was just exploring. Uh, it's hard to know. Um, hold on, there's lots of questions here, Tom. Yeah, um, that's great. Uh, for the wolves with high number of beaver kills, if there, was, if there were other available sources in the territory, could it be a matter of taste preference that they choose beaver? You know, I don't know. Um, I'm guessing what a lot of it really comes down to is simply um, um, availability and whether the wolves are able or are willing to take the risk to go after other prey. Um, <clears throat> and what I mean by that is beavers are relatively safe uh, food source to go after. They do have um, some pretty serious teeth, um, but other than that, they don't have uh, antlers or horns or hooves or anything like that. So if you're a wolf, you know, maybe you get bitten, but you're probably not gonna die. Um, whereas going after white-tailed deer or going after moose requires um, a certain amount of risk. And so if you can effectively catch beavers, which an adult beaver is gonna be 50 to 60 pounds, um, and you're good at doing it, maybe there's some um, energetic and sort of risk benefit to just going after beavers as opposed to going after deer. But I should sort of preface all of that by saying, I don't think beavers are a good food source if you're a pack. There's just not enough meat there. <clears throat> and so we don't see a lot of packs targeting beaver in the fall when the pack starts moving together as a cohesive unit, um, simply because there just wouldn't be enough meat to go around for all the wolves in the pack. Makes sense. Um, can you determine the difference between kills by different predators like Canada lynx, bobcat, or coyote? Yep, you can. So different predators have different um, ways they consume their prey. Um, and there's been several sort of books that kind of talk about all the nuances of it. Um, cats or felids have their own sort of way of going about consuming prey. Bears have their own way. We have yet to find a beaver or really any prey uh, where we thought a bobcat or a lynx was responsible. Um, we have found uh, several beavers that were killed by bears. Um, and it's usually pretty obvious when a bear kills a beaver because the bears just sit there and they just make this huge area where they're just like laying around, uh, I don't know, rolling around or doing who knows what bears do. Uh, and then there's usually a bunch of bear scats full of bear hair. Um, you know, they're not very conspicuous or inconspicuous predators. It's very obvious what they're doing. And wolves are a little different. So yes, you can tell, but it does take some sort of ability to know what to look for. Ah, what kind of fish were they catching? It looked like pike or catfish. They were going after uh, white suckers, primarily. So that, that creek is what white suckers used to spawn. Have you seen any mange in the wolves you've collared? We have not had any wolves that have had serious mange. We had one wolf last year that had a little bit of it, but it never, it was just a, a little patch of it. And in, in subsequent uh, trail camera photos we got of that wolf, it didn't have any problems. Um, so it seems to be pretty rare around here. It doesn't mean that some don't have it, but there's not been any that we've collared that has been really bad. Okay. Um, what is the average age of the wolves and lifespan? Average age is a hard one to get at. I would say if we, um, you know, we have wolves anywhere from, you know, a year old all the way up to um, 10 to 11 to 12 years old that we followed. Um, most of them, though, are going to be somewhere between one to five years old. And I would say if you had to come up with an average lifespan, it would probably be three to five years, maybe. Um, so if a wolf gets to be older than that, they're really, um, I'd say, fortunate as wolves go. Got it. Um, have wolves been recorded as having eaten berries historically, or is this a relatively new discovery? And also, could we be seeing the beginnings of an evolved vegan wolf? <laughs> I can say pretty confidently that there's probably not going to be vegan wolves, um, or things are going to have to change very quickly. Um, but in terms of it being a new behavior, there are, doc there are instances in the scientific literature dating back to like the 60s and 70s where people would observe um, some wolf scats that had berries in it, but it wasn't a lot like we're seeing. Um, 
And a lot of times they just thought that wolf pups at these rendezvous sites were just nibbling on berries and that's why there were scats in the, or berries in the scats. Um, so nothing that's even gotten close to sort of the prevalence that we're seeing. Um, there are the wolves in uh, Europe that go and eat all sorts of kind, all sorts of fruits and things like that over there from like um, uh, vineyards and other farms and things like that. So it's not entirely unheard of, um, but in our area, we've certainly documented it uh, in a way that I think makes it apparent that berries are a annual, a food source that they rely on annually for a certain period of time. Okay. Um, um, there are questions about how being so large, um, and a lot of them have to do with, does that impact survival? And also, why have ear tags and a collar? Good. Both those are good questions. So uh, the first one about collars, um, which is, does it impact their survival? Um, no, not that we are aware of. Um, when you go to put a choose the collar that you're going to put on an animal, it has to be under a certain percent of their body weight. And this isn't just wolves. This is all animals um, for it to be acceptable for research. Um, so some of these collars uh, look like the, the housing, which is the box on them. They look like they're really big and heavy, but really they're not that heavy. It's just the, the construction of the box. Um, all of our collars are um, lightweight, relatively speaking, collars for these wolves. Um, and we would never put a collar that we thought would inhibit their ability to move, largely because it's not helpful to our study in any way. And we really wouldn't want to do that to an animal. Um, you know, our hope is that we put a collar on a wolf and we get to observe it doing what it does naturally. And so if the collar is impeding that, it really doesn't help us in, in any substantial way. Um, but we've put um, collars on um, 75 wolves and we've never had an issue that we suspected that the collar was the cause of the problem. In this, in that video of the wolf eating the berries, um, that is a collar that we purchased a couple uh, last year that was a new design and we got a couple of them and we really don't like the way that they fit on the wolves. Um, and so that's not a collar design we're going to use again. Um, we've switched to a different one that we think is a lot, um, just a lot nicer for the animal to be wearing. So it is something that, that we are um, conscientious about and that we try to make sure that we make good decisions about. And sometimes we don't know without sort of um, seeing what happens. We don't have a set of captive wolves we can go put collars on very easily and see how the collar works. Um, but we do try to make the best decisions we can by talking to other researchers, etc. Now in terms of the ear tags, this is a question that we get a lot on um, social media. The reason that ear tags are really uh, pretty much necessary is the fact that once the collar um, ceases to work on the wolf, we lose track of it. And I should note that most of the collars that we have on wolves have a drop-off device or mechanism. And so um, what happens is our collars, because we take locations so frequently every 20 minutes, the collars don't last more than six to eight months. And so we want the collar to drop off the wolf so that we can A, get the collar back, and B, so that the wolf doesn't have to wear a non-functioning collar around. Uh, once that collar drops off, without ear tags, we have no way of knowing uh, which wolves are in which packs or which wolves are still alive. Um, but if we have the ear tags and it allows us to determine that, it allows uh, us to determine if our wolves, um, say, disperse um, a long ways away and then they get um, seen on a camera, you know, a couple hundred miles away, which has happened multiple times. Um, it allows us to know if we recapture a wolf that that's the same wolf that we had previously tagged. And then it also helps in videos because the video, the HD video footage allows us to read ear tag numbers. And so we can non-invasively understand what's going on with the packs or who's around simply by that ear tag. So really the, it's really uh, essential. And that's also why the tags are so big um, because we can see them uh, on cameras. If they were smaller, we'd have no way to know what that tag says and it would be not as helpful. Okay. Well, this is a good one to end on. Um, what is the most surprising thing you've learned or most memorable moment since the beginning of the project? Hmm. That's a good one. Um, the most surprising thing that we have learned. Um, 
I would say, honestly, probably the most surprising thing that we've learned is, is really um, how wolves are, are really hunting beavers. Um, it's really quite fascinating. We've got a lot of stuff that will be coming out here hopefully soon in the scientific literature and we'll sort of share. Um, but basically we're learning how wolves are specifically choosing their spots to hunt beavers. And that's really led to some fascinating um, insights into how wolves go about hunting beavers. Um, so that's been, I think that was totally unexpected because when we started our work, we thought there was no way we're gonna be able to understand a lot of the questions that we're actually uh, looking at. And so, uh, especially regarding wolves and beavers. So the fact that we were able to do that was just awesome. Um, in terms of memorable moments, um, there have been, a lot of memorable moments. I would say probably the most memorable that I can think of recently um, was uh, last year. It was actually my birthday by chance, um, but I was out searching some clusters of GPS locations from um, a cup from one of our collared wolves and I stopped on this beaver pond and I was grabbing lunch there. It was a great day and I knew that uh, the rendezvous site was close, but I wasn't sure uh, I wasn't 100% certain that the rendezvous site was there. So I let out a couple howls and um, just to see if I could hear the pups responding. And I heard the pups answer and I was like, that's pretty cool. And then it was, it was a really quiet day. And all of a sudden I just heard like starting far away, just like this, just crashing coming through the brush. And in about 30 seconds, four wolf pups popped out on the other side of the pond across from me. And they just sat there and I just sat there totally still. I just couldn't believe it. Um, and they just sat there on the other side of the hill or the other side of the pond. And I just sat there and watched them from the hill for about uh, five minutes. And then eventually one of them caught me moving and they kind of trotted back in the forest. Um, but that was really incredible just because I've never been able to see wolves like that ever here. Um, so I thought that was really amazing. Well, I just got goosebumps. So thank you very much. And what an amazing way to have a celebrate your birthday. Yes, it was. Um, yep. Gosh. But, um, you know, thank you so much, Tom. We so appreciate you being here. And, you know, for everyone who's joined us, I really encourage you all to find um, the Voyager's Wolf Project on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, there's so many great educational posts, really interesting, really adorable uh, footage as well. And you can also find these things on the website, which is just www.voyagerswolfproject.com. Org. Um, and also for those of you who would like to contribute to the project, you will find a link to donate via that website. Um, also, if you want to learn more about the Wolf Conservation Center, our scientific webinar series, or the 50 wolves who call the Wolf Center home, uh, please visit our website at www.nywolf.org. So Tom, thanks again for offering your time to discuss this interesting topic. Uh, it's really been great. Sure. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.